Assalamu alaikum. Uh, today we will uh, discuss a quick uh, anticipated way how to tackle with the pediatric patient. Okay. So any questions from obstetric anesthesia if anyone wants to ask before we start uh, pediatrics? Am I audible to you? Sir, uh, not for the obstetric. I have another question. If, yes, yes, know, please. please it's ask. related to the ACE inhibitors. Okay. Uh, how they uh, protect in cardiac failure means mechanical protection. Decrease. Man I told decrease them that you know, somebody asked me. Uh, the, you, what is the mechanism of action of ACE inhibitor? Uh, Jamil, I cannot hear you. I'm sorry, we cannot hear you. Uh, My sides. It's in pathophysiology. Uh, you but know, everybody actually, knows, otherwise no problem. I will find. Um, any anyone has got any idea about this question? I have no idea. Uh, okay, so actually, I think uh, uh, it is a reduction in the uh, preload. Okay, and it is uh, uh, causing like uh, vasodilatory vasodilatory effect. So increase the cardiac uh, load. That's what I can uh, I can tell. I don't know about uh, I don't know anything else. Yes, I'm sorry. Actually, I was disconnected. Uh, so I reconnect myself. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, actually, uh, uh, the thing which I know, and I think that's the only thing which um, is ex easily explainable, is that it increase, it uh, decreases both preload and afterload. Okay? So it reduces the stress from the heart, and that's why heart is liberated from over overburden. Okay? So that's what I can I can explain, and if it has some effect, yeah, no, actually, actually, they have some cellular level effect because it's also used in SLD, hmm. also used in di uh, diabetic nephropathy. No, that uh, is because... di diabetic nephropathy again, uh, Jamil. Diabetic hmm. nephropathy is also related to effects from angiotensin two, so it improves the perfusion. Okay. Yeah, actually, on the kidney, it's uh, you know uh, definite uh, effect on the uh, efferent uh, uh, arterioles. It delayed the infrared. Okay, Jamil, I, I I think um, I think we we will we is something uh, we can I will I I will I will try to search the answer and I will try to answer. Okay, so okay, uh, no problem, sir. Yeah, yeah. We, so we can continue. Yes, yes. we have to continue start the, the topic. Yes. Uh, so actually, just like uh, yesterday, we discussed about obstetrics in a different uh, way. That you have uh, you have been called that you have a, a pediatric patient, like uh, a four year four years old patient for some surgery. So what will be the challenges you will have for in that patient? Like you, what what things you should be anticipating in these patients? Yes, Jamil, four years child for any surgery to start with, and then will we go to any any specific surgery? Sir, first, uh, I have uh, some uh, in the pediatric age of groups, I have anatomical, pharmacological, and uh, physiological considerations. They have uh, different from the adults. Uh, Jamil, I am really sorry. Uh, Jamil, yeah. I am sorry. I, I, I will have to mute you. Your, your voice is not audible. So everyone will be disturbed. I'm really sorry. Try to have your connection in a better way. Yes, anyone else? You have a pediatric patient. What challenges will face? Anyone wants to speak out? Um, okay. So actually, actually what, uh, just a second.
uh, I just try to just uh, have a them chalked out here. So can you see the screen? Okay. So actually, the you the challenges will be that history taking will be a difficult thing, and you have to take the history from the mother or uh, any any attendant with the with the baby father or anyone usually, uh, and then you have to see the birth history and milestones and any history of any congenital heart is congenital disease. Okay. And usually you can get this information by asking whether the baby is taking fee, uh, it, in younger babies, it will be like that slightly elder than you. Again, you can have the, about the physical activity and the landmarks so that you know that there is no problem like that. Then uh, NPO history is very important. Uh, it is uh, important in any other patient as well, but uh, uh, because of the uh, compromise system in the baby's uh, dif anticipated difficult airway. Uh, so it is uh, it is of utmost important to have a good feeding history. Uh, cyanosis upon crying, enzolysis and rapo building. This is a very uh, important challenge which the uh, which you will have to see. In there are so many different ways to ha handle it. We will just try to have a capture of how how we can do this. Actually, we I have discussed this topic recently. <coughs> in five or six sessions, the whole of uh, pediatric anesthesia. And if you want anything in detail, I, 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 I will just try to have a uh, summary here and rest of the things. You know, I request you, all of you to mute yourself. This is disturbing for everyone, okay? Whosoever wants to speak out, just raise the hand and rest of the people are request to, to mute the mic, okay? So if you want to have a detail, you can um, see the, the pediatric playlist in the YouTube channel. You will find do my details. I'm, I will try to uh, finish it and, and, and as quick time as possible. So for enzolysis, you, you either you have to make a repo building in some countries or some setups. You have uh, a, a mock uh, play like play like uh, play line like area where the same things which the baby will be facing in the operation theater. They, they make uh, the model for it. And this, uh, this is also a way. Enzolysis may be done by oral route or intramuscular or uh, through an, a number of, of ways you can do, okay? IV line will be a challenging thing. So either you can, you will have, you will have to go for inhalational induction and then take the IV line or there are another option is to give intramuscular ketamine to take an IV line or another way will be to put EMLA cream. EMLA is a eutectic mix, mixture of local anesthetic. So you can use that thing uh, 25 to 30 minutes, 30 minutes before, and then you can try for IV line. So these, these uh, uh, will be a challenging thing, okay? Then there are more chances of anticipated difficult airway because of anatomical uh, changes as well as physiological changes. Both will be the reason for difficult airway and uh, uh, exaggerated responses. So this will be there because there is anterior larynx, tongue is big, relatively big, uh, the FRC is less and oxygen consumption is more, okay? Metabolic rate is more. So babies will just uh, desaturate very quickly. And because their system is like that, that they cannot tolerate the hypoxia. So they can have cardiac arrest following hypoxia in a very quick way, uh, quicker than adults. So hypoxia is uh, the big problem and you will have problems related to uh, mask ventilation because they are edentulous, it's difficult and appropriate size mask sometimes is, uh, is also a challenge. So th they are difficult to ventilate, they are difficult to intubate, they are difficult to do have lingeroscopy, they desaturate uh, quickly. And because they have less, uh, of course in four-year child, the things will be relatively different, but in younger patients, they have less uh, uh, sympathomimetic system and more of uh, vagus tone is more. Okay, so that's why they can go in the uh, in unwanted uh, reflexes. That's why uh, another thing is that the, we give uh, beta two agonist as well, but they respond more to iprotropium. Okay, because because iprotropium is anti muscarinic. Okay. So it has, it is because the more challenge is here is more of the Okay, so this is one thing. Then another uh, related to monitoring challenge. Monitoring challenge means and the monitoring equipment will be different. 
uh, you will have to be, uh, uh, it is like normal pulse oximeter even cannot be placed in a baby, okay? And uh, it would be difficult to have a proper size uh, BP cuff. So that will be a challenging thing, okay? Then taking uh, IV lines, of course, I, I told you that it's a, it's a, even if you, uh, the baby is in, in with inhalational induction, after inhalational induction, you can face problems. So you have to be ready for ultrasound vein, vein visualizer, okay? And uh, in addition to, to that, in, in addition to this thing that because uh, they are having less developed system for uh, challenging, for, for response to hypothermia, and because they don't have the shivering mechanism and they rely on the um, uh, this uh, non-shivering -shivering thermogenesis by brown fat. So that's why you have to maintain the temperature of uh, the operation theater. That will be a big challenge uh, because uh, just uh, give me a second piece. Yes, sorry. Uh, so now you are understanding. Any any questions up till now? Okay. So uh, in addition to the logistic challenges, uh, you have log logistic challenges. You have to have the proper uh, size uh, equipment. Then you have to maintain the the operation theater temperature. You will have uh, uh, you. And another important thing is meticulous dose calculation. Okay, because uh, the normal uh, calc uh, the, the normal concentration if you use maybe you are you can overdose okay and uh, so you have to this is one of the important factor and then they have altered pharmacokinetics they have high volume of distribution so initial doses may be higher but because their liver and kidneys functions are relatively less mature so uh, you have to decrease the maintenance doses okay so this is uh, another important thing uh, yes, heart rate dependent cardiac output means practically what you have to do that uh, usually, usually if there is uh, any any hemodynamic instability, our our baroreceptor, chemoreceptor reflexes, uh, uh, and the control of the blood pressure mechanism, sympathetic system, it uh, it helps us uh, cope or cope up with it. Okay, but uh, in these uh, patients, in these in these in these age group. Uh, these uh, like compensatory mechanism are not very developed. Okay, so the problem is that if you if they uh, their cardiac output is dependent on the heart rate, so if they go uh, in bradycardia, they are not able to maintain the cardiac output. So this is this is why you have to maintain the cardiac output, uh, maintain the heart rate. Okay, so this is the. Uh, uh, so another thing uh, is the, that uh, in the premature babies. Uh, you, there are chances of uh, respiratory depression, and uh, so you have to do the uh, post-operative apnea monitoring. Uh, post-operative apnea monitoring. Okay, uh, emergence delirium is also a factor, and there are a number of medications which are associated with emergence delirium uh, that are uh, like uh, atropine and. Uh, hypothermia, if you are not controlling the pain, this is also a factor for uh, delirium. Inhalational agents, especially seoflurane and desflurane, though they are giving a good recovery, but actually they are associated with more of uh, delirium than uh, uh, halothane and isoflurane. Okay. And then another important challenging thing will be that if in any other patient, it's easier to estimate the blood volume and blood loss. Okay. But here, actually, blood volume is higher, and it is difficult to, to actually calculate uh, uh, blood loss, okay? And you will have less margin, okay? Because if, if maybe 100 ml is not a significant blood loss in an adult. 100 ml will be a big uh, significant blood loss in a, in a pediatric patient. So you have to be very careful about calculating the blood volume, calculating the allowable blood loss, and... Uh, early recognition and anticipation. Okay. So that is uh, another important thing. So uh, I could just chalk out these few things. Um, these are the things we, I, I will be just telling you. Another very important thing is related to uh, fluid management. Okay. Uh, 
uh, fluid management is uh, before there was a, uh, a myth that uh, babies they should be giving they they used to have a very terrible peds solution okay so peds solution was actually 10 percent dextrose uh, uh, dextrose water with i don't know what terrible fluid it was but it it is it is absolute obsolete so you have to use isotonic fluids okay isotonic fluids and preferably ringer lactate normal saline can also be given but ringer lactate is a balanced solution and uh, ringer lactate or hartmann's like uh, plasma light okay you can give her uh, as well uh, like uh, normal saline you can also give but this for at least for replacement okay replacement or dehydration okay so dehydration and replacement should be calculated with isotonic fluids Repl maintenance yes with maintenance you can do with five percent five percent dextrose water normal saline yeah dextrose saline half normal saline okay so this will be uh, uh, can be for maintenance okay we uh, we calculate uh, the the maintenance fluid with the formula of 4 to 1 holiday cigar formula everyone knows about it and then you have to assess the severity of dehydration okay severity of dehydration and uh, usually it is uh, 1 to 5% 5 to 10% and more than 10% things like that so and that you will be looking at because the what is the difference the normal changes which occur in adults heart rate and blood pressure is not very reliable here okay so it is more reliable on the conscious level the fontanelle okay and uh, the mu mucous membranes okay dry mucosa and uh, dry the dry eyes or and uh, increase capillary filling time okay so importance of assessment okay assessment of uh, the dehydration is very important how to assess the severity of dehydration and then replace it so and another concern that some people say that uh, these because they have less glycogen storage gly 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 less glycogen stores so they can tend to hypo for hypoglycemia okay so for that thing actually you you can monitor the blood sugar levels this is one thing and in at the patient at risk especially the premature babies okay so in premature babies there are chances of more chances of hypoglycemia so in those patients, you can have a separate for 10% if you want, if there, there is a, a documented hypoglycemia, or you can have this 5% dextrose water now, as I told you, okay? So this is related to the another important aspect to cover is analgesia, okay? Usual paracetamol, okay? NSAIDs. Uh, ketamine okay then blocks okay then opioids the, the we can use all combination paracetamol sometimes is given uh, as a preemptive analgesia and actually they add midazolam in it okay midazolam with Parastamol, they are you they, they use it for as a pre preemptive analgesia as well as for enzolysis. Okay. Uh, then uh, parastamol suppositories or even IV parastamol 10 to 15 milligram per kg. Uh, you can give. Okay. And you have to take care of the the, the safe dose. You do you can you should not give overdosage. NSAIDs is not uh, not contraindicated in, uh, in pediatric uh, patients, but if there is there are patients with uh, uh, this one uh, patent duct dependent circulation. Okay, uh, I will just discuss about this PDA. Uh, uh, for that, you should be knowing uh, about the fetal circulation. So, in fetal circulation, this ductus arteriosus is bypassing the blood which is going towards the pulmonary artery. 
but because the the lungs are filled with uh, fluid in these patients so the blood is uh, diverted through the ductus arteriosus and enter the aorta okay so uh, as uh, the baby has the first cry usually it is uh, uh, with the increase in po2 and decrease in uh, pulmonary vascular like what happens with first cry pulmonary vascular resistance is decreased and uh, like uh, uh, oxygen is leading to closure of of pda okay so uh, the, uh, in in these in these uh, because there are two separate pathways in coming in the right atrium and uh, right ventricle then left atrium left ventricle okay so what happens that the 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 blood is coming through superior vena cava and inferior vena cava okay so this blood which is coming is highly like uh, uh, coming from the upper part of the body coming from through the superior vena cava okay so this is having low oxygen saturation okay and it is it is going through foramen avail i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry this is not through foramen avail this one is coming from here i will just try it again please this is superior vena cava this is inferior vena cava okay and uh, blood which is coming from the inferior vena cava is coming from actually through the uh, the placenta okay and it is highly oxygenated blood okay it is coming through the placenta and then entering through uh, bypassing the liver through the ductus venosus and entering in the inferior vena cava this is highly oxygenated blood this blood is going from right atrium to left atrium okay and from left atrium it is going to left ventricle and through left ventricle it is going to aorta okay aorta and what happens that in initial part before i will tell you before this uh, right uh, uh, the the blood coming from the superior vena cava it is coming from right atrium to right ventricle and then through pulmonary artery it is going towards lungs but what happens that there is a ductus arteriosus here which is bypassing the blood from the pulmonary artery to the aorta here the significance of this place is very much because before this point enter there is blood supply to to upper half of the body upper half of body head and neck okay so this is uh, through thyro cervical trunk okay through th thyro cervical trunk this is uh, going uh, uh, to and after that this ductus arteriosus come which is blue blood okay so after this ductus arteriosus comes here the the blood which is after that is actually relatively deoxygenated okay so that is the concept of this patent ductus arteriosus and if any patient which has patent ductus arteriosus and you want to have the accurate oxygen saturation the place which is uh, mandatory is right radial artery okay so if you are reading the neonatal anesthesia you will everywhere you will find in congenital diaphragmatic hernia and in uh, tracheoesophageal fistula you will find that you have to take right radial artery which is preductal and it is accurate okay because it is before the mixing i hope you understand uh, i ha i have tried to explain to you in the maximum possible way do you understand if anyone does not understand you i i, I can re explain but this concept of uh, wherever you will be reading this neonatal anesthesia you will re read about this preductal and postductal so preductal is right radial artery and it is before the the mixing of the blood through through ductus arteriosus okay so uh, uh, so we have just uh, tried to see different anatomical physiological 
okay and pharmacological changes uh, regarding uh, uh, because in, in between I just uh, jumped from one topic to other topic but I'm just trying to give an idea uh, we were discussing analgesia actually so uh, we, we, when we this uh, 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 I talked about NSAIDs and we came here because NSAIDs uh, will block it okay uh, duct will be closed because of it is inhibiting the uh, the the prostaglandins which are maintaining this ductus arteriosus okay so when you give NSAIDs this these uh, prostaglandins are inhibited and it result in the closure of ductus arteriosus okay so uh, this is uh, one point I, I was telling about yes uh, analgesia so uh, ketamine is a good choice uh, uh, it is uh, like uh, as i told you that it is given in pre operative period as well uh, to avoid uh, uh, problems challenges related to iv lines and angiolysis okay but remember that it increases secretions so you have to cope with it and you have to preferably you have to use glycopyrrolate Okay, you have to use glycopyrrolate or atropine. Atropine is not a good choice because atropine passes through the blood-brain barrier and it is one of the big factor for uh, post-operative delirium and it can theoretically cause, uh, 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 because it blocks the uh, secretions, so it can increase uh, the, the, the terminology of atropine fever. Okay, so it's not a very good choice. You can give a glycopyrrolate. Opioids, short-acting opioids is not at all a problem, but uh, try to, you, in, in premature babies, morphine is to be avoided because it can cause respiratory depression, okay? Uh, otherwise, you can use, uh, but you the same thing that initial doses will be maybe requiring a little higher, but maintenance doses will cause, met because metabolism is slow and excretion is slow. So you have to avoid morphine. Another reason is that, Morphine has active metabolites. So it's not a very good choice in premature babies. That is another reason uh, for it. Okay. So blocks, uh, uh, pediatric anesthesia is a, actually subspeciality. I have never given uh, 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 central neuroaxial block, but theoretically it's possible. And you have to calculate. Usually this is not uh, to be asked in uh, in our exams, uh, uh, like postgraduate exams for anesthesia. This is for specifically for pediatric anesthesia. Uh, the, they ask about uh, this caudal block, okay? So caudal block, uh, actually, uh, uh, there is a way to calculate uh, the, uh, there is armitage regime, okay? Uh, for uh, the, the problem is that, you have to calculate the safe dose. This is another, uh, that usually it is uh, uh, like uh, you calculate 0.25% okay, of uh, bupicane, okay, and it is from 0.5 to up to 1.5 ml per kg, okay? But what's the problem that 0.25% uh, means 2.5 milligram per ml. Okay, so if you are, uh, uh, for example, if you have a 5 kg baby, so the safe dose is 10, 10 milligram. Okay, so uh, if you are giving this, uh, uh, calculating according to this armitage regime, sometime it becomes, it can become a very uh, toxic dose. So you will have to reduce the, the concentration. Okay, because maximum dose you can give in this 5 kg baby is 10 and 10 milligram. Okay, so if you have to calculate, you can only give 4 ml maximum. Okay, so if you want to give more than 4 ml, if you want, for example, 1.5 ml per kg, so it may be around 7.5 ml. So you will have to dilute it, you will have to make a 0.1%. Okay. So th this is what, what thing you should be knowing about caudal block. Otherwise, uh, uh, it's a it's a good um, for any procedure below the uh, level of umbilicus and uh, sacral region. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, another thing. And otherwise, uh, 
so peripheral nerve blocks uh, are challenging because whenever you are giving peripheral nerve blocks, you only can do it for analgesia because baby will not allow you to have a surgery performed under um, uh, a nerve block. Okay, so usually practically it's not used. So uh, uh, if you have any pediatric patient for any surgery, like they can ask you about a very common is tonsillectomy. They in any uh, any uh, Every other exam, they ask about adenotonsillectomy. So there are chances of bleeding. Okay. There is shared airway. Okay. Again, in addition to all the changes which are there, so in addition that uh, there is shared airway, there can be dislocation, uh, dislodgement of tube. Okay. And uh, this is associated with significant post-op pain. Okay. And uh, there are concerns related to throat pack. Okay. And this patient can have post op bleeding, re bleeding. So you have to consider about it. And uh, uh, another thing is that what I was telling you. Okay. So they asked that this patient had tonsillectomy and after that it re bleeds. So the same principle which I told you that you have to assess the levels of dehydration. Okay, and this patient will be full stomach. It will be difficult to assess the severity of bleeding. So dehydration will be a difficult challenge to get. You are expecting full stomach. There will be second anesthesia if you are. They are bringing again, bringing the patient again to the OR. Okay, uh, are, are you people with me? Are you understanding? Is if if you don't understand anything, you can raise the hand. No response. There is no response for any one of you. I'm sorry. Okay. So you are getting. If anything, don't you don't understand? Let me know. Yes, Shamil. Um, why we have considered these patients as full stomach? Yes. Uh, if you have a patient with ton, a post tonsillectomy bleed. Where the blood will be going? The baby will be as, uh, is swallowing the blood. Okay? So swallowing the blood and this is, will be in the stomach. And it's an irritant. Okay? So this is the reason for considering full stomach. And another uh, reason is that it is difficult to uh, estimate the blood loss. Okay? And babies, all babies have risk of uh, difficult, anticipated difficult airway. And following a second anesthesia, the, following a first anesthesia, there may be some edema. Which and occur, I will I will just discuss about the uh, endotracheal tube difference between cuffed and uh, uh, uncuffed endotracheal tubes. So we we can discuss that. Usually they have the narrowest point. Okay, is uh, cricoid cartilage. Okay, cricoid cartilage. Okay. Cricoid cartilage. So they are prone to have subglottic stenosis. Okay, and if you have if you know about the mechanism of flow. So any decrease in diameter, okay, is significant effect on flow, okay. So in babies which have already have narrow narrow lumen, if even a, a little bit of edema occurs, this can significant significantly affect the the the, the resistance and uh, it can de significantly decrease the the flow, okay. So this is a big problem. So if you are That's why whenever you are uh, uh, give, uh, doing, actually we, we use dexamethasone for uh, not only for post-operative nausea vomiting, it is also uh, used as anti-inflammatory, okay? So that's how you cope. And it's still, if you have any edema, you can have some uh, 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 like uh, hydrocortisone because the hydrocortisone effect will be occurring quickly. And then you have another option is racemic epinephrine nebulization. Okay. Which can reduce the edema. But anyways, in this scenario, you will be using a relatively one size, maybe less endotracheal post if you are having the second anesthesia. So these are the things. Otherwise, the same, same thing, same concerns. Shared airway, dislodgement, uh, uh, throat pack, 
dehydration, how to calculate, how to replace. Okay, so this is uh, the same thing. And actually, before they used to be uh, actually high pressure cuff before. Okay, so that's why in uh, old pediatric anesthetists they are not using cuffed endotracheal tubes, but now the endotracheal tubes are low pressure, high volume. The, the these days. Okay, so there is no problem in uh, using a cuffed endotracheal tube. Okay, cuffed endotracheal tube, rather you will say that the, it will have a good seal. Okay, and it is preventing aspiration, preventing dislodgement. Okay, so it's actually a better choice. So uh, uh, whenever you are passing it, you may be using a little uh, uh, smaller size. And if, if you have any doubt, maybe you don't inflate the cuff and you can monitor the cuff pressures. Okay. And at the end, if you are using cuffed endotracheal tube or uncuffed endotracheal tube, if you are anticipating airway edema, you have to do, you have to do air leak test. Okay. That you will let have you will increase the airway pressures and you will try to uh, listen to a leak. Okay. If there, this leak is not there, it means there are suspected edema. And actually, you can compare with the preoperative state that initially, if you are giving a little higher pressure and there is uh, some leak, and at the end, you don't have this, it means that there is possible edema. So you have to anticipate accordingly, okay? So another uh, case they ask is about hernia. So rest of the things will be same. You will use, use the word. There will be altered physiological, anatomical, and pharmacological considerations uh, necessitating your anticipated changes in anesthesia management, okay? And the things which I have discussed about the monitoring, about the uh, angiolysis and everything. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, hernia may be uh, emergency. Okay. So emergency surgery concerns, patient may be full stomach and everything like in uh, obstructive, uh, if, it, if, if there is obstruction or if it is not obstruction, then, then in uh, the, because there, there are uh, congenital hernias. Okay. So that will be just like, and they, sometimes they do laparoscopic or open. Okay, so if they are doing laparoscopic, there will be concerns related to laparoscopic surgery. If they are doing open, uh, there will be concerns related to open. So you can have this ilio inguinal nerve block in that area for uh, inguinal surgery. Okay, so this is one of them. Then there is a, a surgery which they ask is about laparotomy. Okay, in the laparotomy, again, the same that it is usually for intestinal obstruction following maybe a congenital intersusception or things like that. There may be any reason. There, there are chances of typhoid uh, perforation. Okay. So it may be rupture of uh, intestines, uh, like a, a, rup a rupturated bowel or physical obstruction. So there will be concerns. Uh, and even there are an incidence of uh, having worms. Okay. So uh, laparotomy, almost the same concern. If they are doing it uh, laparoscopically or open, there will be concerns related to post-op uh, respiratory complications, pain, okay? And rest of the things will be the same. You will, your answer will be again in the same direction that there will be chances of dehydration. There will be chances of aspiration and risk of the things again, the same, which we already discussed. Same concerns you can tell in that patient as well. Okay, and then they ask about uh, circumcision. Okay, in circumcision, they can ask about penile block. You can read about penile block. And again, the message, again, any regional block, you, you start that you will be taking proper consent, explanation of the procedure to the parents, and then calculating the safe dose. In, a, in addition to the normal things which you will be telling in any patient that resuscitation equipment and emergency drugs and intralipid and everything you, you say in any patient. But here you have to meticulously calculate the safe toxic dose because this will be a challenge in, in these babies. Okay. So we uh, like airway management, we discuss. Okay. Altered CVS, then uh, liver, kidneys, 
Okay, now, now the last thing which I left is now the congenital anomalies. Okay, uh, in the dehydration, the one of the, uh, the thing which they ask is infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. In this patient, actually there is uh, obstruction at the level of, level of pyloris, so there is vomiting and uh, they use the word this projectile vomiting. Okay. And when the vomiting is lost, hydrochloric acid, potassium is lost, okay? Sodium is lost no, uh, in the, uh, and then what happens? There is dehydration, okay? Dehydration and with hypokalemia, hyponatremia, hypochloremia, okay? And there is alkalosis, metabolic alkalosis. So now what is the body response? Body response is, and, and, and yes, another, another difference is that usually in vomiting, which we do, there is also coming something coming from the intestine because of negative peristalsis. So there is also loss of bicarb. But here, what happens? There is no loss of bicarb because there is pylorus is closed. So only there is, actually there is a reciprocal increase, which is adding fuel to the fire. So there is even more high, uh, bicarbonate in the body. So it is adding there is by hydrogen loss and there is uh, excess of bicarb. So this is another thing which happens. And then what happened that the body response is running angiotensin and aldosterone system. So it is uh, uh, increasing the, to try, try to compensate the sodium at cost of potassium, okay? But what happens that there will be critical hypokalemia, which is compatible, not compatible to life. So what happens instead of potassium, they will be kicking out hydrogen. So this is the last component of this uh, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis that there is hypokalemic, hyponatremic, hypochloremic, metabolic alkalosis with paradoxical acid urea. Paradoxical acid urea. There is already loss or deficiency of acid, but it is in, in the other direction, crazy. They are losing the hydrogen. So this is called as paradoxical acid urea, okay? So uh, they will be asking that, uh, will you proceed? You will correct the dehydration first, and then you will proceed. And they, they, you, they will be listening you two words, four quadrant suctioning. There will be risk of, uh, Aspiration, of course, because but do you will be doing four quadrant suctioning? You will be optimizing the patient. So now, now your sodium, potassium, hydrogen, so this one uh, bicarb, okay, and urinary chloride because uh, urinary chloride when they appear and uh, urine output is adequate, then you say that patient is ready for the surgery. Otherwise, you will not proceed with the surgery because if it's not a surgical emergency, it's a medical emergency. Okay. So in a medical emergency, you will, not, you will not proceed till the time you have optimized the patient. Okay. So you will optimize the patient and then you will proceed. And there are uh, 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 like, uh, will you do rapid sequence induction versus inhalational induction? Okay, actually you can do both of them because there is risk of aspiration, but at the same time, um, uh, uh, there you may face difficult intubation. So like there are both options you can do. Rapid sequence induction you can do and inhalation induction you can do, okay? So this is one thing. The other is congenital diaphragmatic hernia and tracheoesophageal fistula, okay? So Can congenital- you explain about uh, four quadrant uh, suction? Four quadrant suctioning mean you- Rotate the baby and you do uh, suctioning through NG tube in four quadrants of stomach. Okay. This is called as four quadrant suctioning. Okay. So congenital diaphragmatic hernia or TOF. Remember one thing there is a, 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 a thing is vector, one pneumonic and one pneumonic is vectoral. Okay. So in, in if you have a patient with the trichoesophageal fistula or congenital diaphragmatic hernia, if you, uh, there is a pneumonic and there is a syndrome like these patients will have one anomaly that are associated with other anomalies. So there may be one or more than one 
associated congenital anomalies. Okay, so V is for vertebral anomalies, A is for uh, anal dysplasia. Okay, and uh, T T is for tracheoesophageal fistula, E is for esophageal uh, atresia. Okay, and R is for renal dysplasia. Okay, and in this C, C is cardiac anomalies. Okay, so uh, in, if you have such patient, you have to, again, because this is not a surgical emergency, again, this is a medical emergency. So in congenital diaphragmatic hernia, because the lungs are not mature usually, the abdominal contents are in the lungs, in the thorax. Okay, so uh, this, uh, this patient will have... Uh, um, uh, a problem with the lungs maturation and there is pulmonary hypertension. Okay. So you, you have to give pulmonary vasodilators. Okay. And this patient might need to have ECMO for the lung maturation till the time lung are mature and they are using also surfactant. Okay. So uh, the problem will be regarding, regarding airway pressures airway pressures because if you give uh, a positive uh, like in a positive pressure pressure ventilation you over inflate relax there will be pneumothorax okay because their lungs are not mature so you will optimize the patient and you will uh, let the lungs develop before surgery okay so there will be you uh, role of uh, and another thing is that uh, this one uh, uh, in these patient, if you give because there will be high requirement of FIU2, okay. But again, there will be if you are giving high FIU2, there are chances of bronco pulmonary dysplasia, okay. So this is uh, and if you are giving high FIU2, there are chances of retino uh, this uh, retinopathy of prematurity, okay. So actually, you have to. Uh, titrate at the lowest possible FIO2 with permissive hypercapnia. Okay. And also air maintaining the airway pressures. Okay. Maintaining the airway pressure. So this is how you have to uh, proceed in congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Okay. In the in the top, uh, they ask the question about. Uh, uh, the what are what is the most common type? So uh, it's a uh, like esophageal atresia with distal TOF. Okay, there are many types you can see about it, but usually this type is the most common one. Again, there are chances of these congenital anomalies. And here, what is the problem that you you will have a blind pouch because there is esophageal atresia. So the NG tube will be stuck there. Okay, NG tube will be stuck there, you will put an NG tube there, th that place where, and you will do, do the suctioning and uh, you will try to deflate as much as possible. And then again here, uh, uh, because some of the concern in tracheal fistula and congenital diaphragmatic hernia are both the same. Even in here, you will not do too much positive pressure ventilation. Okay? Because if you are giving positive pressure, the, the air is going through the lungs, through the fistula, to the stomach as well. And when stomach is inflated, stomach is inflated, it is decreasing the FRC further. Okay. So, and because uh, these patients have uh, these uh, pneumonias because of aspiration. Okay. So, again, you have to optimize the patient before proceeding for the surgery. And uh, induction will be inhalational. Induction with uh, preservation of spontaneous ventilation. And then what will you do? That you will push the tube and maybe you will do endobronchial first. Okay. And then you will keep on auscultating, auscultating, auscultating. And then you will, a place will come. You will pulling out the tube and the place will come where there is fistula. The place when this will become, there will be gurgling sound in stomach. Okay. You will slightly withdraw it 
and then you will find the place where there is uh, no gurgling sound. So then you will push it back. Okay. I repeat again that you will do endobronchial. Then you will slightly pulling out and you will see the place where there is uh, gurgling. That, 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 that place will be the place of fistula. Then you will push it again. Okay. So then there will like you have to place the endotracheal tube between crina and fistula. Okay. So it should be uh, distal to fistula. Okay. And proximal to crina. So this is how you will be fixing the tube. And then again, avoid positive pressure ventilation till the time you have fixed the tube. After you have fixed the tube, then you can do it. And even these patients, it is preferable to extubate. Extubate if, extubate if uh, there is no other contraindication. Because if you do, do positive pressure ventilation, there are chances of an astromotic leak. Okay, so it is better for post-operative care in NICU, of course. Okay, so it is better to extubate early if, if of course, extubation conditions are there. Okay, so same is true for congenital diaphragmatic hernia that you have to mature the lungs. These patients may, be, may need post-operative ventilation, but you will try to, uh, like, uh, first of all, you will optimize the patient. Only then you will proceed for the surgery. And once you have optimized the patient, uh, then uh, you have to take in take, take care as I told you that if you give airway pressures there will be pneumothorax. There are chances of pneumothorax here and uh, if you give too much post-operative positive pressure ventilation there are chances of an osmotic leak. Okay? So this is all about uh, these two diseases. Then another uh, is uh, the abdominal wall defect. This one is exophthalmos and one is and uh, it is, uh, sorry, uh, 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 I'm sorry. This is omphalocel. I use the exophthalamus, the wrong word. Omphalocel and other is gastrogysis. Okay. Gastrogysis is a, is a, is a different uh, congenital anomaly because usually it is isolated. It is isolated. It is uh, peripheral, not in the center. Okay. And it is more dangerous because, because without sac, without peritoneal sac, okay? So there are more chances of dehydration and there are more chances of visceral injury, okay? Like the, the abdominal contents are outside. The abdomen is open, okay? So this, this uh, and another important thing is that this is usually isolated. Omphalocele, on the other hand, is with the sac, and it's usually in combination with other congenital anomalies. Again, the problem will be of dehydration. Okay. So the same concerns which I told you that you will be optimizing the patient and then you will be doing the, the surgery. Okay. So uh, I think uh, I just have covered uh, a number of uh, the common topics which are being asked. Any questions? Yes, please. Uh, sir, can you explain paradoxical aciduria again? Paradoxical aciduria again, okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, usually, what is the effect of aldosterone? Uh, uh, sir, hydrogen, sir? Retain sodium. Please let him speak. Please let him speak. Yes. What is the uh, what is the mechanism of action of aldosterone? Who was speaking? Who asked the question? Uh, me, sir, Hamza. Yes, Hamza. What is the mechanism of action of aldosterone? Uh, sir, I'm not clear yet, sir. Make uh, bed blenders. So, Sorry? So I'm, I'm not clear about the mechanism, sir, right now. Okay, aldosterone is uh, acting on the kidneys, okay? And it is uh, retaining the sodium 
and uh, at the cost of potassium. Okay, so retention of sodium and excretion of potassium. Okay, so usually in this condition, the baby the baby is vomiting, so hydrogen is lost, chloride is lost, body is dehydrating. Okay, and because in this uh, scenario, bicarb is not there in the vomiting. Bicarb is not there in the vomiting. Okay, so bicarb is also lost. Uh, sorry, bicarb is also absorbed. So there is more bicarb in the body and there is a loss of hydrogen. Okay, so actually what kidneys should be do doing, actually they should be retaining the hydrogen. Okay, but in this condition, what happened, what happens that if aldosterone keeps on uh, retaining the sodium at cost of potassium, there is significant hypokalemia, which is not compatible to life. So in that condition, instead of keeping hydrogen, kidneys excreting, start excreting hydrogen. They are, uh, they are conserving potassium and they are removing more hydrogen. So that is called as paradoxical acid urea. Paradoxical means opposite. Okay. So it is against the normal effect. The normal effect is in metabolic alkalosis is to retain hydrogen. Am I right? Instead of retaining hydrogen, it is actually losing hydrogen. Okay. Okay, any questions before I finish? Okay. Um, thank you very much.